Hey everybody, I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott, and this is your Right Angle Lightning Round! I love doing this, mostly because of that look on Scott's face that you're seeing right now. All right, as I'm sure you know, uh, each of us take turns hosting a bonus segment, and uh, when it's my turn, instead of going deep into one story, I collect a bunch of headlines, seemingly at random, but really with uh, evil and malice in my black little heart, and then I inflict them on Bill and Scott, and they have no idea what's coming. Isn't that fun? So let's dig right in. Scott, I'm going to start with you first because you're making that face again. Uh, oh, and you know what? Let me peel back the curtain just a moment here. Scott always says, oh, lighting round. Uh, but he sent me this headline. That's right. This is all on him. Yeah. The man's entire <laughs> life is a lie. Uh, Scott, Justin Timberlake can't remember <laughs> lyric to his own song after having urine thrown at him. You know, who hasn't had this happen? Um, <laughs> that's, that's my thought. <laughs> actually, the situation was it was a, uh, a charity concert in Toronto uh, at some point in the past, uh, of course, because no, everything happened at some point in the past. Anyway, <laughs> and the Rolling Stones were there, ACDC was there, and I guess Mick Jagger asked Justin Timberlake to be part of this event. And when he came out on stage, he saw that, uh, that a lot of people in the front row seemed to have not had time to get to the to the restroom and so they had bottles full of urine and, and, and uh, I guess some people were not really hoping for Justin Timberlake at an ACDC Rolling yeah. Stones kind of event and so began throwing their own human waste at him um, and this <laughs> caused him to forget the lyrics to his own song and I just say that's probably uh, the most Justin Timberlake thing I've ever heard. <laughs> And I think, and you can hardly blame the guy. I mean, uh, that's yeah. I, you, who, nobody should have to work under these conditions. I know when that happens at my job, like when Bill starts throwing those bottles at me, I, I have a hard time remembering what my topic was. So I got to do something. I can't just stack them against the wall like I've been right. doing. Well, and as I as I remarked in our backstage episode, I think that one of the things that shows the decency and civility of the Rolling Stones ACDC crowd was the fact that they were urinating into bottles and not, <laughs> not just on the ground. <laughs> Sustainable bottles, recyclable bottles. <laughs> well, I well, they, recycled they recycled them recycle as those. projectiles. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to add to this. Uh, I don't think Justin Timberlake deserves to even listen to Exile on Main Street, let alone be on the same stage with <laughs> Mick and Keith and the rest. But oh, I would like to add that if Stephen Green were to try that, that would in fact be a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> that if you attach some kind of a, of, a, of a fuse device, it would burst into flames. Yes, Justin Timberlake would have suffered third degree burns. <laughs> Oh, there's a Michael Jackson joke in there somewhere, but I'm going to I'm going to leave it alone too soon. All right. Uh, Bill. Oh, head of Wuhan Hospital who caught corona coronavirus is still having treatment, say Chinese health officials after Chinese media reported that he had died. I, this is a serious issue with this, but can we trust anything coming out of Beijing or, well, anywhere else out of China at this point? No, and you never could. Yeah. They're a communist state. They, they 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 control their people through information, and and that's why they have their own internet and their own um, websites. So many millions of websites are blocked, and why they have their own game servers and things of this nature. Uh, no, you can't trust a word they're saying. Um, I have been reading about the 1918 uh, flu epidemic, uh -huh. which killed 20 million yeah. people. It's the largest pandemic in history in terms of total lives lost. It was in terms of percentage, the Black Plague killed a lot more people. But in total numbers, 1918, 19 influenza strain, strain carries it all. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was was reading about, uh, the, the author is very good. And he said it was the first time that, that um, nature ever went to war against uh, humanity when humanity was armed with science and, and science was able to do an awful lot. But nevertheless, once that thing breaks out, it breaks out. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because uh, every indication of what we've seen from the coronavirus is that this is nothing, nothing like that kind of um, uh, mortality rate. Yeah. Influenza is a particularly uh, tough disease. It is, in fact, it is the toughest disease to contain because the flu virus mutates so quickly and is able to disguise itself so well. But the the particularly virulent strain that killed so many people in, in 1918 doesn't seem to be present here. Uh, you, you could make the case that a totalitarian regime might be able to quarantine 
uh, a population more effectively than a, a democratic one does. They simply sealed off the town of uh, Wusan and, and the people are going to die in the streets and that's what they're going to do. But they just basically shut it down. There's some evidence that it came from a, uh, a potentially came from a Chinese um, bioweapons plant. In any event, um, this has been a, a, a PR catastrophe for uh for the for the PR, uh, the People's Republic of China. It's it it shows what totalitarian governments do. It shows people. Videos have leaked out of people who are you know hospitals that are just filled with patients and bodies, and 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 this is how communism treats its people. That's what it does. If it's going to embarrass us, and it means we have to let an entire city die off. Because we don't want the embarrassment of, of admitting that we that we might have been responsible for this, then if we have to kill a few hundred thousand people, small price to pay. This is how socialism works. Is what it does. And no, of course you you can't trust them. Um, but uh, it is it is a real indication of what of what this kind of government is, and uh, and and as I say, it is a catastrophe for them. Um, it, 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 just, just as a quick little flash, the, it, the, the influenza pandemic of 18 and 19 was called the Spanish flu. Uh, that's what it was referred to because the reason it was called the Spanish flu was because at the time World War I was going on, Spain was neutral. And Spain was one of the only countries that didn't censor their own newspapers. So even though it didn't start in Spain, actually started in America, started in Kansas. Even though that, the, even though it didn't start in Spain, it became known as the Spanish flu because they were the first newspapers to actually report on this horrific outbreak. Um, and that did a, an awful lot of damage to the Spanish nation and their reputation mm -hmm. and so on. This one is fully deserved, on the other hand. And um, and while I've, I've looked a little bit at the disease and its morbidity and its mortality and so on, morbidity and mortality uh, – it doesn't seem like the kind of breakout threat that that should cause all of us to really, you know, completely panic. With all that said, it was handled about as badly as it could be done. And the only way to defeat disease is not through control; it's through information. It's through it's through quickness, fast, agile uh, responses on the spot with people who are empowered to act in the moment, which is the antithesis of the Chinese government. And we'll know that China is a mature society when they decide to invite like the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization and all the people that know how to deal with these things. When we see those people being invited into China, we'll know that China's finally grown up enough to play ball with the rest of the adults in the world community. Yeah, you talk about playing ball. I, I, I love trading with other nations, but we're learning a big lesson here about the dangers of having global first world trade with a nation with third world health practices and communist world honesty uh, about what's mm -hmm. going on. Uh, we've been talking about decoupling from China, and I think this really point. drives the point home about how important that is. Just uh, All right. Uh, Scott, here we go. Congressional Budget Office says graduate and professional school students account for 81 percent of student loan forgiveness. Does it seem like if you become educated as a Democrat, your odds of getting student loan forgiveness go way, way up? And upon what basis are the loans forgiven? Because of inability to pay or because those people go into teaching professions in inner cities so that they can have their debt released? Do you happen to know yeah. the answer to that? Yeah, not a whole lot of graduate students and professionals, as in doctors and lawyers, uh, going in to teach middle school in, uh, in Detroit, <laughs> I don't think. Just a thought. Yeah, I, I think that there are um, obviously there are some professions that require many many years of schooling and uh, and lots of detailed learning and experience that goes along with that. Um, and so I'm not trivializing the need uh, perhaps for advanced education like this. However, there are quite a few people who seem to see schooling itself as a profession, and as long as you can borrow money at zero interest and keep deferring the payment of it, and then perhaps eventually being forgiven the debt, as Bernie Sanders has promised. Uh, as so as Elizabeth Warren promised that we will all be forgiven our student loan debt, um, then there's no impetus to get out into the real world. And, and I'll be honest with you guys, there are days when I go to work and I think, wouldn't it be great to be laying around a library somewhere right now, just reading books, 
and writing stuff. Oh, yeah. And, you know, library, uh, books. Sorry, I'm sorry. That's a kind of a primitive Please. concept. <laughs> At the scriptorium where. <laughs> In the dorm, playing, looking through the parchments you know, World of Warcraft. and the uh, yeah. and the clay tables <laughs> <laughs> with your wand turned pages. Right. So you know, there. I, I think that uh, <laughs> I've always felt that the people who take this money should also be taking the risk. So if you're going to borrow student loan money, then you should be take the risk, and that's true for most people who who borrow student loans. But the other group that's taking this money, and really the end user of the money, is the university system, the teachers, right. the administrators, all those people are the ones that really benefit from cheap money, from grants, and from and from zero interest loans in effect or low interest loans. Um, and and those people are not responsible at all. So if you're Princeton University or if you're you know Stanford, you can take unlimited amounts of money from somebody with no culpability as to what becomes of that person. You be, even though you're allegedly training them with an advanced education so that they can be of service to society, you're not responsible in any way for their actually being of service to society or ever being able to earn an income. Those are the people we really need to be going after is these universities who've used the cheap money to be able to jack up the rates and have no accountability for the outcomes or the results. Yeah, no accountability. That says it all right there. Oh, I got to tell you, every time I hear Liz Warren say she's going to make all this debt go away, I just want to raise my hand and say, how? <laughs> Just a thought. Never gets old with me. No, it really doesn't. You can do that every single week, and I I'm, just, I'm fine with it. I, I just want to issue another apology to <laughs> Native American peoples for the shame that is Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> oh, I, 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 she makes me feel sick inside. She really does. All right, uh, Bill, four Virginia state senators break party ranks to kill Bloomberg-sponsored gun control legislation in committee. This happened on Monday of this week. They actually decided to table it for a year, but tabling, as we all know, is just their little way of uh, avoiding embarrassment by not having to kill it outright. Mike put uh, $10 million into that Virginia election last year, and he can't seem to buy himself gun control legislation. Do you want to thank uh, those 22,000 uh, gun owners who came into Richmond last month? Do you know why these legislators did this? They did it because the legislature building has windows. That's why they did it. <laughs> no, 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 um, no. And I'm not talking about the operating system. I'm talking about the what now? How many? Yeah. Really? They're carrying what? <laughs> well, no. Um, yeah, this is – see, whether – I don't know I, – I, I honestly don't know whether or not legislators, both Democrats and Republicans, understand this on a conscious level. But I think on some feral level that they operate on, I think it's clear to both sides that when conservatives come out and protest – it's serious. Yeah. We don't get paid to come out and protest. We don't uh, do it a lot. It's not part of our identity. We don't brag about it at cocktail parties. And generally, it means we have to take a financial hit rather than get a financial check. So when conservatives come out in large numbers to protest something, I think both sides realize that there may actually be something going on here. Uh, this isn't an astroturf kind of thing. Uh, it, it's It's you know, it's it's not just reassuring from the gun point of view. It's reassuring from kind of almost like this meta constitutional point of view. And I'm serious about this. It's yeah, like the people are if, still sovereign, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like if the if the legislature has decided amongst themselves that hey, gun control would be an awesome idea, and then they decide to push it because some governor decides that you know that some woke uh, you know ad agency has told them it's what young people want. And then they decide to go ahead with this and they look outside the window and they see, you know, uh, the pitchforks and the torches and, and, and all the rest of that stuff. The peasants are revolting and they certainly are. Uh, then, then, um, then for them to actually change their minds and say, mm, we might have misjudged this. That's kind of how the thing is supposed to work. And I'm, I'm very, very happy about that. My favorite moment from that protest last month, and I can't believe I'm only thinking to mention it to Bill Whittle members and viewers today, but there was a black guy marching with a, with a couple of his buddies claiming to be Governor Northam in blackface, and he was telling people <laughs> to make way for his white privilege. Yep, it was great. And another guy had a sign that said, I'd rather be, a, 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 I'd rather be a, an American than a Democrat, and and 
that's where they've put themselves. I'd like to see them come but it back. Was, I it was Democrats would. who blocked this. Am I not correct on that, Steve? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the committee vote was uh, 10 to 5 against, and there were uh, five – uh, excuse me, there were six Republicans on the committee of uh, 15. I, I think I've got these numbers right. And four of the Democrats broke ranks with their own party to uh, to table this thing for a year and effectively kill it. That's what ha- that's what happens when you turn to the right, look outside and see high capacity magazines. Oh, high uh, high speed magazines. Oh, is that what they said? High speed? No, no, that's a, it was a, I mean, it's it, it was one of the tropes. I mean, the, the gun control people get so much wrong because they just I know, it's hilarious. Know I've seen... I've seen somebody ejecting like a bullet uh, casings from from a revolver. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, there was that Simpsons clip that my buddy Ed sent me a couple of days ago where the guys tried to put a magazine in a revolver in some episode of The Simpsons from whatever. And I, I got back to Ed. I said, well, you know, a revolver holds six high speed magazines under the shoulder thing that goes up in the pistol grip suppressor. <laughs> <laughs> and I sound just like Mike Bloomberg when I say that. Yeah. All right. Oh, hey, word of me. I got to wrap this thing up. Uh, Where was I? Oh, this this one's going to be in the classic uh, shot chaser format. So shot again. These are actual headlines. Why boosting turnout in November may be tougher than Democrats hope. And it was a worry (laughs) piece by some Democrat and the chaser. Trump drives massive turnout in primaries despite token opposition. So one side seems to be having a problem with turnout when they've got 11 million candidates running and the other side's got pretty much one guy and they're showing up in droves for him. And Donald Trump, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, he held that big rally in Iowa right before the Iowa debacle, I mean caucuses. And Mm -hmm. he's holding another one of these rallies on Friday of this week, the day before the Nevada caucus that the Democrats are holding. And I bet this thing is going to be gangbusters, just like the one in Iowa is. And let me tell you, I I am looking forward to the 2020 election in the exact same way I wasn't looking forward to the 2016 election. It just yeah. it, it looks so much like we were going to get cream by Hillary and the DNC and the, the, the 24-7 air coverage provided by the media is just just so impossible to beat. Trump did it, and his secret was going straight to the people, and he's doing it again, and he's doing it right before the Democrats hold their caucuses, and it, these these things are huge. It's an amazing thing to see, and wow, I just, again, I don't, I'm not getting cocky. God only knows what's going to happen on November 3rd, and at this point, I think even he's throwing up his hands sometimes, <laughs> but I feel good about this. I'm enjoying watching it in the same way that got me into politics in 1980 when I was 11 years old, watching Reagan take it to Carter. And it's just, it's a joy to feel young again. (laughs) It really is. And that is your Right Angle Lightning Round brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. You know, these members... These these lightning rounds used to be members only content. Our members uh, insisted that we inflict them on the wider audience, and we thank them for that. <laughs> Whatever you think about it, I hope you keep watching, and I hope you become a member. Go over to BillWhittle.com and uh, look into becoming one of our sponsors. We'd love to have you on board. Thanks for watching, and I'll have another lightning round for you in three weeks.